Hello and welcome to this first of a series of pre-recorded training sessions on the mitigation hierarchy with a particular focus on environmental impact assessment. My name is Kirsten Day and I'll be the narrator for these sessions. The background for this training is rooted in the need to provide context for some of the recent developments and additions to the EIA process in South Africa, including the species protocols linked to the screening tool, as well as the biodiversity offset guideline. The source for this training is the content of a draft mitigation hierarchy guideline, the formulation of which has been a collaborative project between the Endangered Wildlife Trust, EnviroInsight and BirdLife South Africa, with additional expert advice and assistance from Susie Brownlee. The project has been supported and sponsored by Rand Merchant Bank. Although the draft guideline does not have a formal legal status, it draws heavily on the principles and requirements articulated in South African law and is intended to support improved implementation of the mitigation hierarchy within South Africa's distinct legislative and policy context. The training has been broken down into five separate sessions and each recording is approximately 15 to 25 minutes long. I will quickly run through what each session will cover. Session one, that's this session, will provide the background and context for the training. Session two will focus on the relationship between impact significance and the mitigation hierarchy. Then sessions three and four will cover the steps in the hierarchy itself, starting with the preventative component and then the remediative component. Finally, session five will talk to how the mitigation hierarchy ought to be applied in EIA reports, that's the EIRs and the EMPRs, as well as the conditions of authorization. We have tried to intersperse relevant examples throughout the training to illustrate the theoretical components. So a bit more detail about what I'll cover in this first session. I'll start with the definition of the mitigation hierarchy, then consider the need for a mitigation hierarchy guideline and who the target audience is for the guideline. And I'll follow this with an outline of the legislative sources and policy context for the mitigation hierarchy and finish with a brief overview of core principles and the desired outcomes of the mitigation hierarchy. So before we dive into session one, I should stress that these recorded sessions are a condensed introduction to the mitigation hierarchy and there is considerable more nuance and detail in the guideline itself. So it is advisable to refer to the draft guideline as well as other articles of literature to gain deeper insight in how to apply the mitigation hierarchy. And then a few key references have been included at the end of the mitigation hierarchy guideline to guide you with further resources and information. So given that the training focuses on the role of the mitigation hierarchy in EIA, it is worth revisiting the purpose of EIA. There are many different formal definitions of EIA which embrace its purpose. One of the most often cited is IAIA's definition, that is the International Association for Impact Assessment, which describes EIA as the process of identifying, predicting, evaluating and mitigating biophysical and social effects of development prior to major decisions. This definition covers the scope of the EIA and also links it to decision taking. And underpinning the definition are firstly that the impacts or effects as they are referred to here include direct, indirect and cumulative consequences over space and time which are catalyzed or brought about by new activities. Second, and particularly relevant to this training, is that mitigation is a core component of EIA. What mitigation does is seek to reduce negative impacts via a sequential process of avoidance, minimization, remediation, and compensation. And it is these sequential steps that are encapsulated in what we refer to as the mitigation hierarchy. So in the mitigation hierarchy guideline, we define the hierarchy as an approach to avoiding negative impacts and where they cannot be altogether avoided to minimize and remedy them through rehabilitation, restoration, compensation, and or offsetting. This definition is consistent 
with how mitigation is explained in the Section 2 Principles of NEMA, that's the National Environmental Management Act. In order to ensure a common understanding of meanings, with few exceptions, the meaning of mitigation-related terms, or the definitions of these terms, that have been included in the Draft Mitigation Hierarchy Guideline are the same as those in existing EIA-relevant guidelines, protocols, policies and legislation. So the triangular depiction of the mitigation hierarchy on this slide is one that you'll become very familiar with during the course of this training, and I will get to describing it in a bit more detail towards the end of this session. So let me step back at first and consider the need for a mitigation hierarchy guideline. Notwithstanding the existing number of guidelines, protocols, templates, tools, etc. associated with EIA in South Africa, we thought that there was a gap when it comes to the mitigation hierarchy. And now more than ever, particularly with recent targets declared in the Global Biodiversity Agreement, there is an imperative to focus on protecting and maintaining biodiversity and ecological services. South Africa is one of numerous countries that is currently in ecological deficit, with demand on natural goods and services exceeding what these can provide. And the most recent National Biodiversity Assessment indicates that an increasing percentage of indigenous taxa are under threat of extinction. Then there is also growing reliance on ecological infrastructure, to mitigate against effects of climate change and also to support resilience and adaptive capacities of communities that are most susceptible to these effects. So it's important to keep in mind this critical relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem services. In this regard, it must be stressed that biodiversity should not be treated as an exclusive preserve of ecological scientists or botanists, but rather as being critical to livelihoods more generally. And this has also been emphasised in the Global Biodiversity Agreement, the goals of which make explicit reference to valuing, maintaining and enhancing nature's contribution to people. I'm sure most of you will be familiar with this notion of ecosystem services. That is the functions and the benefits that ecological infrastructure provides for the benefit of humankind. And I've chosen quite pretty pictures here, rather than images of destruction. But unfortunately, many of our landscapes are being destroyed along with the services they provide, including services such as access to clean water, stable slopes, grazing, land for agriculture, medicinal plants, flood retention, economic opportunities, access to heritage and spiritual sites. And without these services, South Africans face increasing risks and suffering. And then there's also the financial costs that come as a result of floods, fire, drought and hunger, the occurrence of which we have seen escalating in South Africa and across the world in the last few years. So against this background, the purpose and intent of the Mitigation Hierarchy Guideline is to heighten awareness of the link between biodiversity, ecological infrastructure and processes and services, and also to convey the basic principles and optimal approach for applying the Mitigation Hierarchy in Environmental Impact Assessment. So who is the guideline primarily aimed at? Well, the primary audience are the EAPs, specialists and competent authorities. But there are a range of other stakeholders who would benefit from the content of the guideline, including commenting authorities, developers, lenders or investors, conservation groups, CBOs, that's community-based organisations, as well as NGOs and any other stakeholder who may be interested in or affected by a development proposal. So why focus specifically on EAPS and the EIA process? Well, in the first instance, the EIA remains one of the most critical tools at our disposal to prevent or limit the loss of biodiversity. However, what we often see reflected in EIAs 
is that EAPs, while familiar with the theory of the mitigation hierarchy, are challenged when it comes to applying the hierarchy in practice. And as the points on this slide suggest, many of the EIA reports that we are seeing lack explicit reference to the mitigation hierarchy, despite it being entrenched as a principle in NEMA. One of the key shortcomings is a failure to properly consider alternatives as an avoidance strategy, even though this consideration is required in terms of the EIA regulations. But what we often see is that EAPS default to motivating for a preferred site because that is what the developer has proposed as their most favoured option. And then coupled with this is a tendency towards a default argument in favour of the development, rather than consideration of no-go alternatives or lower impact alternatives. And this is justified in terms of job opportunities or economic development. But what we are not seeing is the biodiversity and associated ecosystem services as being framed as also offering socio-economic benefits. Now I've listed a number of other issues on this slide which we intend to cover in the training, including a lack of attention to cumulative impacts, variable and inconsistent approaches to calculating significance, which is a key determinant of the need for mitigation, too much faith in the viability of restoration as a mitigation strategy, and then non-prudent recommendation of untried measures, which is not in keeping with the precautionary principle and then also vaguely worded or non-measurable recommendations which are then transferred to the conditions of the authorization. So I've already mentioned the NEMA principles and the fact that the definition of the mitigation hierarchy is reflected in these principles. The EIA regulations also require the application of the mitigation hierarchy and this requirement is reflected in the species protocols, which I won't be going into in too much detail. However, I will be considering which of the NEMA principles are most relevant, given that these place an onus on all organs of state when making any decision or taking any action which affects the environment. So that covers not only provincial environmental and planning departments, chiefly responsible for reviewing EIAs, but also the National Department of the Environment, the DMRE, the Department of Water Affairs, the South African Heritage Resource Agency, and any other authority with environmentally related decision powers. In Section 2 of NEMA, specifically Subsection 4, avoidance, minimization, and remedy is required in respect of a very broad range of eventualities, which includes disturbance to ecosystems, loss of biodiversity, also referred to as pollution, disturbance of cultural or heritage sites, waste, and then this very wide, generally applicable principle, and that is negative impacts on the environment and people's environmental rights, all requiring avoidance, minimization, and remedy. Another relevant principle in NEMA highlights the connection between use of resources and levels of acceptable change or thresholds of concern. And this is something that we will be referring to again in the next session, which deals with impact significance. So the important thing about NEMA and its principles is their relevance to all organs of state in making decisions that affect the environment. So moving on to our international obligations in respect of the mitigation hierarchy, there are many different international environmental conventions and agreements to which South Africa is a contracting party that adopt a hierarchical approach or make explicit mention of the mitigation hierarchy, such as the Convention of Biological Diversity. In addition, and particularly relevant to EIA for internationally funded projects, are the IFC performance standards. And these convey the mitigation hierarchy requirements quite explicitly, particularly in Performance Standard 6, which refers to the first three steps of the mitigation hierarchy and then also to biodiversity offsets and the fact that these should only be considered after application of the first three steps. Performance Standard 5 focuses on land acquisition and resettlement and also requires avoidance, minimization, 
restoration and compensation. So getting back to our local guideline, there are several key principles and desired outcomes which are described in much more detail in the guideline document than what I can capture on this slide. And it is these principles and outcomes which reflect what we regard as priority focus areas in applying the mitigation hierarchy in the South African context. And they include a focus on avoidance. In other words, embracing the notion that prevention is always better than cure. And as will be stressed in subsequent sessions, avoidance also carries fewer risks in both environmental and financial terms. Secondly, Irreplaceable loss should be identified as a fatal flaw and not be traded off for jobs or economic benefits on the presumption that these are always better or more desirable than ecosystem services. Significance should be linked to thresholds of concern and limits of acceptable change. And then additional mitigation must be applied to residual impacts if these remain after primary mitigation measures have been applied. Biodiversity offsets should not be framed as a go-to solution, but rather as a last resort, particularly given the costs, the challenges and levels of uncertainty associated with this form of compensation. And then we've also stressed that it is imperative that people or communities are not left worse off following the implementation of compensation measures. Cumulative indirect impacts must be considered, particularly if there is a significant lag time before landscapes and ecosystem services can be fully restored. Then the precautionary approach must be adopted. There must be consultation and mitigation measures detailed in the EMPR must be stated such that they are measurable, enforceable and auditable. So I've gone through these key principles or outcomes very quickly, but the most importance of these will be described in more detail in subsequent sessions. This last slide is intended to leave you with this visual image or depiction of what the mitigation hierarchy model looks like. And there are two things to stress in relation to this model. Firstly, the important distinction between the preventative and remediative components of the hierarchy. Preventative being avoidance and minimization, and remediative being rehabilitation or restoration, and compensating or offsetting. And then second, to highlight the importance of the triangular shape, which is indicative of that need to focus first and foremost on avoidance of impacts in the pre-planning or pre-application phase of a project, as this is the most effective solution for looking after and protecting biodiversity. So it remains for me to thank you for listening to this first session and a reminder that our second session in the series will focus on the intersection between the mitigation hierarchy and the assessment of significance in EIA.